welcome to our midweek service. Let's take our songbooks tonight and sing 439. Dwelling in Beulah Land, number 439. And let's stand together as we sing. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is called. Then I know the sins of earth be set on every hand. Doubt and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move. service and prayer, please.
be seated. Amen. We're going to go ahead and take uh, prayer requests tonight. I just saw a, a prayer request, an urgent prayer request a moment ago. Uh, be praying for Absidy. Uh, most of you uh, know Absidy. Uh, she was uh, hit by a vehicle uh, today and uh, has, uh, she's okay, but has some, uh, some issues. So don't know all the health issues there, but be praying for Absidy. Her injuries. Be praying for, I got a call uh, just a few minutes ago from Brother Ahmad. That he was on his way here, and uh, just before he got here, just feeling really sick, so decided probably not a good idea to be here tonight. So be praying for him as he is sick. Be praying for uh, Rebecca and Hannah, my daughters. They're going. They're helping uh, Brother Newman uh, this week. They've been the last couple nights. Uh, they'll be tonight and tomorrow. Uh, he's having a special meetings there. They're uh, uh, watching uh, children down there for him, helping with the meeting. So be praying for them as they're ministering there tonight. Any other new new prayer request this evening? This guy. praying for uh, Greg, that's, uh, uh, what's your name? Colton's, Colton's brother, sorry my brain cells aren't working. I saw a hand over here who had their, or maybe I didn't, yes. Oh, they're not coming, they told me. <laughs> so I'll pray for those coming for the wedding. Appreciate your prayer for my appointment on Monday. Hopefully I find something. I think they're going to amputate. We'll find out for sure. But appreciate your prayers there. Answer your prayers. Good to see you be here tonight. And they finally uh, took all of her wisdom out. And she has no wisdom now. And uh, feeling better. Any other new? Yes. Miss Gemma. Pray for this guy that my husband passed away. Uh, there is a Filipino guy. And my husband Arnold started talking to him and gave him a shot and invited him to church. What's his name? Randon. Randon? Yeah. Okay. Catholic background? Yeah. Yeah. Pray for Randon. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. And, uh, Welcome. How long? How long have she been here now? Um, more than thirty days. But she's got, going back to the Philippines on Monday, so she's going oh, back. Oh, we'll be praying. Praying for family here. Too. Thanks for being with us. We're glad to have you, Maseda. Before I forget, after church, I need to ask you a quick question. If you'll come see me. Yes, sir. Oh, praise the Lord. We've been, I don't think we've prayed for it on Wednesday night, but our men's, our men's prayer breakfast has been praying for, <coughs> for a couple of months now. I've been praying for uh, David's niece. That's great news. Let's keep praying for her, though. Yeah, exactly. And remind me her name again. I have it written yeah. down, but I would. Yeah, I've got to put, her, put her over the edge. <laughs> yeah, remind me her name. Erin. Uh, Sir. I just want to tell me, so it's not for the wrong thing, but it's like the, the burn that Aaron keeps coming back. And forth. If you start drinking coffee, brother. <laughs> I'm not following. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Be praying for the Mohammed family. I'll never forget, I was in the hospital a couple of days after I had a heart attack and Jeff, by the way, pray for Jeff and Teresa. I believe they're dealing with a cold as well. But 
Uh, Jeff had brought me a cup of coffee from Starbucks. And as I was sitting there drinking my Starbucks coffee in the heart ward at the hospital, uh, my heart doctor came in, a cardiologist, and Jeff's like, oh, you're going to be in trouble now. And my heart doctor walked in, and he looked and said, oh, you like coffee? I said, yes, sir. I said, I drink as double espresso every morning, drink coffee all day long. He said, good, it's good for your heart. That's why you're doing so good. Keep drinking it. So uh, that's why I like my doctor, amen. But uh, any, any other new prayer requests uh, tonight? Any other new? Yes, sir. What's his name again? Aaron. Aaron. Any other? Oh, yeah. Praying for Brother Tim. Tim Sober. For work. Any other new? Yes, Ruby. What's the name? Dolly. Dolly. Okay. I'm assuming not pardon. <laughs> Be praying for Dolly. Praying for Pray for both of them, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> praying for his pardon. Amen. I like that. I like that, Ruby. How to preach right there. I like that. Any other any other new new prayer requests? this evening of course we have many folks many folks sick kind of cold cold going around most of us have already had it or you're going to get it and uh, be praying for those folks um i believe that's any say anything else quickly all right let's go ahead and go to prayer this evening lord thank you lord for the opportunity to to gather together tonight lord i Praise you and thank you for what you've done, for what you're going to do. Lord, as we pause, Lord, in the middle of a busy week, Lord, we pause on purpose. <coughs> Lord, I ask you to be involved in our lives and the lives of our friends and our family members, and the lives of those whose lives our lives touch. Lord, I pray for abstinence tonight. Lord, I don't know the severity of injury. But Lord, I'm thankful that you do. And Lord, I know you're the great physician. Lord, I pray you just touch her body. Uh, give complete healing. Lord, raise her up. Be with her mom and dad. I'm sure a very difficult, fearful time for them and family. And Lord, I pray you just uh, uh, be very close to them. Pray for Brother Ahmad tonight, Lord, as he's not feeling well. Lord, I think of uh, Lord Teresa and Jeff, Lord, as well. I believe a cold situation there and others that are not able to be here tonight, Lord, I pray you be with them. I pray you be with Rebecca and Hannah, Lord, as they're ministering there in the capital city this evening. Lord, I pray you just uh, use them to be a blessing. Uh, Lord, I think of Greg, Colton's brother. Lord, I pray for the physical issue there, the blood clots. Lord, as well, I pray you'd help him as, Lord, he looks at the direction of life and decisions ahead. Lord, I pray you'd give him the the mind of Christ, give him your wisdom, and bless him. Uh, Lord, I pray you be with him as, as he leads his family. And, uh, Lord, I pray you just uh, minister to every every need of his heart and his life and his health. Lord, I do pray for those that are traveling in the next week, Lord, for the wedding. 
uh, Lord, all the preparations for that and details. And, uh, Lord, just ask that you would be glorified and honored there. Thank you that, uh, Lord, you created uh, man and woman. Lord, you designed marriage. Lord, thank you that uh, we can glorify you and honor you, uh, Lord, as we uh, see that pictured out here in, in public. Lord, I pray you just bless uh, that, those traveling. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd be with the uh, appointment I have on Monday. Lord, I pray you'd help me to get some direction and find out what's happening here. Uh, Lord, that way we can start making a plan going forward. Uh, Lord, just asking for healing. Lord, I pray I uh, wouldn't need surgery, but Lord, if I do, I pray that you get it scheduled soon. Lord, I pray you'd uh, be with this Randon, this man that Arno got to speak with. Uh, Lord, I don't know the condition of his soul, but Lord, I pray you'd use the, the witness. Uh, Lord, I pray that he'd see you, his need for you. Lord, I thank you for the praise report that David shared of his niece coming home. Lord, we've been praying for her. Lord, I pray you continue to be with her. Lord, I know there's a very difficult situation. Lord, I pray you just bless. Lord, I thank you that you're able. Lord, I pray that she would see you. Lord, I pray for the Muhammad family. Lord, I know they've been struggling health-wise as well. Lord, I pray you just give complete healing there and bless them. Lord, I think of these clients that John spoke with yesterday that don't have a church home, uh, Christians outside the city. Lord, I pray that they would, from the gospel track yesterday, they would spark the reminder by your Holy Spirit that they need to be involved in a local home church. Lord, I pray you just encourage them. Lord, I think of this man, Aaron. Lord, a couple of very difficult blows. Lord, I think of all the family associated with this, the friend that was murdered. Lord, how many must be hurting and reeling over the brokenness there. And Lord, on top of him losing a friend, losing a, a pet of many, many years. Lord, I pray you just give comfort. Lord, I pray you just be close to him. Lord, I do pray for Brother Tim. Lord, I pray you'd give him direction, leading for work. And Lord, he'd find the exact place that you have for him. You'd meet his needs. And Lord, I pray for this lady, Dolly, that Ruth met that is lost. Lord, we do pray that she would see her need of a Savior. Pray that she would realize that you are the only hope that you are the answer. And Lord, I thank you for Ruth being, or Ruby being able to talk with her. Lord, I pray you just uh, bless uh, the witness there. Lord, I pray for other needs tonight. Lord, I think of those that are not able to be here this evening, those that are under the weather, or those whose schedule won't allow them to come. Lord, as well, I think of those who are wandering from you in their heart, in their mind, in their life. Lord, I pray you would draw them close to yourself. Lord, as we <coughs> talked about on Sunday, this matter of maturing, Lord, help us as we strive together in maturity to encourage one another in growth. And Lord, I help us to see those that are struggling, that we might lift them up, that we might encourage them. Lord, I pray for our city. I pray for the need of the gospel here. I pray for laborers to go forth into the harvest. I pray not only for our harvest here, but all across our country. And Lord, the great need, and Lord, the great need of laborers. Well, the harvest is there. We just need laborers. The gospel is there. We just need laborers. Lord, I pray you'd send forth laborers. Lord, not just here in our country, but Lord, as we look around the room and we see flags representing a few of the countries around our world, Lord, I pray for those countries, but I pray for others and places where there is no gospel witness. Lord, that you'd raise up laborers. Lord, I pray that you'd draw men to yourself. Lord, I pray for missionaries tonight, those that we have an opportunity to minister with, to partner with. Lord, I pray you'd bless them. Uh, I pray you'd meet their needs. Uh, Lord, I think of the Jackson family tonight. Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with them as they minister here in our city. Uh, Lord, as I just... Uh, read in a prayer report just yesterday, Lord, I pray you'd be with Brother Jerry as he's facing a few health issues and concerns. Lord, I pray you'd give the doctors wisdom. 
um, less there for the 12 uh, uh, vehicle accident this month and no one injured but uh, lack of a vehicle giving them a need Lord I pray you'd meet that need as well just be with them as they endeavor to reach the area of Edmonton where they are uh, Lord would you bless them uh, Lord would you help them to, to minister to the hurting hearts of people here in our city uh, Lord I pray you just uh, meet their needs provide for them uh, Lord we ask for your help uh, Lord to give us direction and focus Lord as we seek to follow your purpose Lord, we ask for your perfect will here. Uh, Lord, we ask for you to be glorified and you to be uplifted in all things. Lord, may your will be done tonight. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Take your songbooks and we'll sing number 121. At the cross, number 121. At the cross where I first saw the light, the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well, my the sun in darkness light and shot his glory. Christ, a mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. A drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, the burden of my heart rolled away. Was there by faith, received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. We'll go ahead and take up our offering tonight, Brother Bonnie. You want to help us with that, sir? Well, it's good to see Brother Bonnie at church on Wednesdays. How long did we pray for that, Brother Bonnie? It's a long time. Praise God for answer prayer. Uh, can I remind you as we think about prayers, we'll go to prayer in just a moment for the offering. So often when we pray, we think that our prayers are useless because we didn't get what we want. Uh, I believe many times when we pray, God wants us to pray because he wants us to connect with him, wants us to depend on him. And although we may not see the answer we want when we want to see it, can I tell you that God's will is always done. And uh, praise God for God's faithfulness to us, even if you say, Pastor, I've been praying for something a long time and God's never answered. Uh, can I tell you that you can trust him? Mm -hmm. yeah, we can trust the will of God. Uh, but Brother Bonnie, if you pray for our offering tonight, please. Let's pray. Our, our Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you and praise you once again, Lord, uh, for tonight. Thank you for the people, Lord, that we can give back to the Holy Spirit that you've given us. Uh, 
the Lord to besides the offering that we reach out to your Father and say thank you and say that just uh, be ready to give to us. a few announcements before we sing our next song. I have them here. Uh, this Friday night is our teen a service activity at 6.30 p.m. So teens, uh, if you'd like to come, we're going to be doing some painting and some other um, work around the church here uh, to uh, freshen things up. Uh, it's at 6.30 p.m. If you can sign up online, just to let me know you're coming. Uh, that way I can plan for food and, um, and make other arrangements as well. And then this Saturday is our uh, regular soul winning time at 10 a.m. Uh, be sure to come out for that uh, and share uh, with our local area the, the gospel message. Uh, this Sunday, uh, next Sunday is, we're gonna make it this one here. Yeah. Okay. Next Sunday, September 24th. September 24th, we'll be starting our Patch Club. Uh, so be in prayer for that. And uh, if you have a child who I have not contacted you about uh, being in Patch Club, please let me know. Uh, we can get that taken care of. Uh, and as well, uh, Thanksgiving Sunday is on October 8th. Uh, be sure to pray for that. Uh, this week, uh, I believe Friday, we'll be picking up our invitation cards uh, from the printer in town. Uh, so you'll be sure to grab some of those this Sunday uh, well, uh, when they're available. And uh, Let's uh, stand and sing our final song for tonight, number 587. 587 at Calvary. I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to talk about the inner life of the church in the book of Acts, and we're going to pick up here in verse 41, in verse 41 we're looking at the aftermath, 
what happened after the preaching of Peter. And last Wednesday night, we spent time talking about that message and what God, how God used Peter. And by the way, it was not Peter. It was the Holy Spirit of God. It was God's work that happened. And that work brought fruition here in verses 41 through 47. And it gives us a picture of the church here in Jerusalem. And follow along with me in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Very important verse there. The Lord added to the church such as should be saved. Let's pray together. Lord, would you help us tonight? Lord, help us to focus on your word. Lord, I pray that you'd remove any distractions away from your truth, away from your word tonight. Lord, I pray that we would focus only and solely upon what you want to do in our lives this evening. Lord, as we look at the inner workings of the church, Lord, may we understand that you have a pattern here, a picture for us today. Lord, your word has not changed. Your plan has not changed. And Lord, I thank you the gospel has not changed, nor has it lost its power. And Lord, would you help us tonight as we look together in your word? Lord, help me as I endeavor to preach your right and teach you right your truth this evening. And Lord, I pray you be glorified for our gathering together from our singing, and Lord, from our receiving of your word and obeying your word. Bless us now. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We have a pattern here in this passage that gives us a picture of what the church, a church, should be like. If we ask the question tonight, what should our local church be like? We find the answer in these verses we just read. What are the marks or the characteristics of a local church scripturally? I'm not talking about culturally. We're not, we're not talking about generationally here. Rather, as we look through the filter of the Word of God, as we look to see what God says uh, a church is supposed to look like, what does the Word of God say? There are some cultures where if you have, Miss Lois, you have a very large stomach, you are the most attractive person in that culture. Man, I would be very attractive in some cultures, Brother Jim. You know, there, there are some cultures that uh, if you have a really long neck, uh, that makes you the most attractive person. They stretch their necks and they put rings on their necks, trying to make their necks longer. Uh, you know, we have some very weird ideas culturally uh, in different parts of the world, what it is, some places, you know, the, the smaller your feet, uh, the more beautiful you are. Uh, so they bind their feet. I mean, all kinds of crazy things happen in our world. By the way, the same crazy things happen in our world here. Uh, people getting chopped up, and, uh, stuff injected into them to look a different way because they want to meet the, the mode of what our culture says is beauty. But I'm not talking about what culture says should be the local church. That doesn't matter. You see, the culture, the world's culture doesn't have anything to do with it. When I was in college in northwest Indiana, in Illinois, just about eh, 45, 50 miles away from where, where I lived, there was a man named Bill Hybels. I mean, have you heard the name before? But the Hybels showed up in that community in the suburbs of Chicago. And he went around door to door, and he asked the question, what would you like to see in the church? And he started his seeker-sensitive church. 
uh, to be what the world and the community wanted to see in a church. Uh, can I tell you, Mr. Heibel's uh, plan of church planning was blasphemous. It had nothing to do with Scripture. Uh, the reality is what God says a church should be is God's determination, not culture's determination. By the way, not our preference, not what we want. What does God say? And tonight I want to give you just a few things tonight about some marks or characteristics of a true church. Number one, we see that this church, this pattern church here in Jerusalem, was spiritually constituted by Christ. This church was spiritually constituted by Christ. That means it was not the work of man, but God's creation. I have in my kitchen <coughs> a espresso machine. Beside that espresso machine, I've got a thing called a knock box. How many of you know what a knock box is? You knock your espresso portafilter to knock the espresso puck out of the portafilter. And it goes in there, and then you can throw it in the garbage later. If you look in my knock box right now, it's got coffee there, natural processed coffee, uh, coffee that has not gone through any kind. Those coffee beans were processed completely, 100% naturally. And because of that, that the coffee grounds in there in that knock box, I'm almost willing to bet if you look, there's probably something growing in there right now, Brother Krim. Uh, a mold, a fungus. Uh, now, it's there not because I created it, but because it's naturally created by those, the decomposition of those natural beings uh, in that knock box. Now, I didn't grow it. It just happened. Can I tell you that Peter didn't constitute the local church? Peter is not the rock on which the church is built. Peter is not the father of the church. Rather, Christ spiritually constituted the church. God made the church. He, he put it together. I want to I read a verse for you in the book of Matthew, in chapter 16 and verse 18. The Bible says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Peter is not the rock. Jesus is the big rock that the church is built upon. He's the one who builds his church. Now, we have the Lord's promise that he would do that. And we see in verse 41, look at our text. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You see, God made this infant church here in Jerusalem by adding to it those that were saved, those that believed. Uh, how was the church formed? We see the gospel was preached. The Holy Spirit produced conviction. That wasn't Peter's job. That wasn't James's job. That's not John's job. That's not your job, and that's not my job. Our job is to proclaim the truth. Peter proclaimed the truth. The Holy Spirit brought conviction, and we see that <coughs> because of conviction, the word of God was received, and the miracle of new birth came. They were born again, added as they believed the gospel, so the Lord's church, and it's his, uh, is constituted by him of believers who have received the word of God, verse 41, and those who have been added to the church by him. It's his church. Monday night, I had the privilege of going to hear a couple preachers from Nova Scotia preach. One of the preachers got up and he said that when he became the pastor of the church he pastors in Nova Scotia, I believe, if I remember correctly, that uh, some, he was inviting someone to the church. He said, oh, that's so-and-so's church. Now, the so-and-so, the person's name, was not the pastor of the church. It was not the founder of the church. It was just someone in the church who thought they owned the church. 
uh, and they made all the decisions of the church. And it was viewed in the community, oh, that's, we use the name Bob, that's Bob's church. Can I tell you, it wasn't Bob's church. By the way, this church is God's church. Every local church belongs to him because every local church is constituted spiritually by Christ. Number two, another picture of what the church, every local church ought to be, this local church was openly committed to Christ. Openly committed to Christ. How many have ever been to a, a sports game? You've been to a football game, basketball game, hockey game. Now, if you watch it at home on TV, it's one thing, but you go to a game, uh, you find some people that we refer to as fans. How many of you know what fans are? That word fan is short for. It's short for fanatic, right? You find the fanatics. And, you know, you go to a, a football game. Uh, if you go over here to the Elks, uh, well, I'm not sure that's a, a good representation of a good sport, but... Uh, we're losing pretty bad, but you go to an Elks game, starts to get cold, you're going to see some people out there, no shirts on, Brother Jim. Got their whole body painted up with the team colors. Uh, actually, most of them are wearing brown paper bags in their head right now, but uh, if things were different, uh, you'd see them wearing crazy costumes. You'd see them acting crazy. Why? They want people to know that's their team. That's the team that they're rooting for. I remember 20 years ago, 20 years ago next month, I went with my dad to the 30-year anniversary of his team getting second in the nation, his football team, college football team. And they honored my dad at a halftime at the game. And at that football game, my dad and I sat together, and we sat beside of a lady who was a fanatic. She was a fanatic. And man, every time Glenville, my dad at the school was Glenville, every time Glenville uh, scored, or every time Glenville had a good run, or completed a pass, or got a first down, she went nuts. She'd jump up and down. I remember one time, right at the end of the game, they were going to lose, and they ended up winning, and she, she turns and grabs my dad, and starts trying to jump up and down with my dad. My dad's not a little man. Uh, she was a fanatic. She was committed to the Glenville football team. This church was openly committed to Christ. The people in this passage of Scripture here in verse 41 through 47 had heard the gospel as Peter preached it. By the way, it wasn't a comfortable gospel. They'd been convicted of their sins. They repented and received the word of God. They believed the gospel. We have described in verse 37 through 40 the reaction here. Verse 40 says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. But verse 41 follows verse 40. The verse tells us those who accepted the word were baptized. They made a commitment. They, they committed themselves openly and said, Hey, I believe. I'm willing to, I'm willing to be baptized. I, I want to make a testimony. I want to make a public profession. I want everybody here to know what happened to me. The Bible says here that they were baptized. They made a commitment. As I was thinking about this message, I was talking to Brother Colton today about a, a day that I got to preach. I don't even know how many times. My wife was there. She might remember. Uh, but I started preaching at 7 in the morning, and I preached every, maybe it was every 45 minutes. Uh, I preached to a different group of people. I had another group of people coming in. And I preached the gospel uh, every, I think it was every 45 minutes until 5 or 6 o'clock. And we saw hundreds of people saved. And we saw a few hundred people baptized. And that was an amazing day. Just uh, looking back, it seems almost unreal. The many decisions made, but can you imagine 3,000 people baptized. Imagine that service. By the way, one preacher preached one time, thousands say, 3,000 baptized. What a glorious testimony of the power and grace of God. Here we have God's blueprint. 
his picture of the early church, his pattern, his design. And the pattern is here that the church was to be openly committed to Christ. Why to Christ? Why not to the pastor? Because the pastor is not the one that constitutes the church. Christ constitutes the church. That's why we're to be openly committed to Christ. And we see that picture here. God's blueprint. We see 3,000 converted, 3,000 baptized. Why? Why were they baptized? In obedience to the command of Matthew 28. What's the command? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And baptizing them. And by the way, it didn't stop that day. If, if that's all that mattered, they could have left. Man, they got all those people saved and baptized. Man, let's go to another town. Forget those people. Let's find more people. Hold on. God's plan was to establish a local church in Jerusalem. Why was that needed? Because that wasn't all of the Great Commission. The Bible goes on to say, and teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. But before the teaching of all things could happen, they had to be openly committed to Christ. And we see that picture here of this local church in Jerusalem. They were baptized as an open confession that they'd received the Lord, that they believed the gospel. Uh, they, if you will, uh, had given up what they were trusting. Their previous religion, many of them were Jews. Many of them uh, had rejected Christ as Messiah, and they said, hey, we now accept Christ as Messiah. We believe the gospel. There were many uh, false, other false religions besides Judaism who came to Christ that day. They were rejecting their false religion coming to Christ. Uh, and we see uh, that picture there. In verse 37, it says, And when they had heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Can I tell you that something wonderful happened? These folks believed, and this church that God established, that Christ uh, empowered, was committed to him openly, an open commitment to Christ. In the early church and in Scripture, you find that when somebody believed, they got baptized. You don't find in Scripture, you don't find the pattern of, oh, they believed, and then, you know, eventually one day they grow until finally they, you know, you think, oh, okay, I can baptize them now. Now, nothing wrong with someone getting baptized at some point after salvation, uh, but that just means they were disobedient from the moment they got saved until they got baptized. Because to live as a Christian, not baptized, you are a disobedient Christian. You are living outside the will of God. We see the picture of the, flip, of the <coughs> excuse me, the Ethiopian eunuch. He said, what doth hinder me from being baptized? What was the answer, if thou believest? And he said, well, I believe. What, what did Philip do? Hey, stop the chariot. Why? We've got to baptize this guy. He believed. That picture throughout Scripture, by the way, should be the same today. Should be the same today. By the way, I'm not angry at folks that have, have gotten veered off a little bit. I think a lot of good folks have gotten veered off of God's plan. But I remember 18 years ago when my family and I came to Canada and we had held the first service as a Cornerstone Baptist Church. Within about a week, I think it was, we had a baptistry and a metal horse trough. <laughs> and that's all it was. We had water in it, Jim. Had water in it every Sunday. So, Pastor, why'd you have water in it? So if we need to baptize somebody, we could baptize them. And it wasn't very many months after I got to Canada I heard word that I was... Uh, I was a crazy preacher. Uh, man, that rice guy, you, gotta, you can't trust him because he'll just baptize anybody to get saved as soon as they get saved. And I said, absolutely, fair enough. You've, you've got the exact measure of who I am. Uh, and can I tell you that we ought to, uh, that should be the pattern. That is what we see in Scripture uh, is the church openly committed to Christ. Number three. Number three, this church was gloriously united, gloriously united in Christ. Notice verse 44. 
verse 44 here in our text. And all that believed were together and had all things common. The key word in that verse is together. Now, I want you to remember who heard the gospel that day. The Bible says there were people that heard Peter preach in their own tongue. In other words, they didn't all speak the same language. I mean, some of them may have spoke uh, some unusual language like Tagalog. I don't know. Uh, Ilocano or uh, Southern Redneck, Miss Lois. Uh, all kinds of different languages were gathered in Jerusalem that day. I mean, the people that got saved were from different backgrounds, different cultures, different socioeconomic places in society. By the way, in a culture with a very strict caste system as well. And yet all those people got saved. People that spoke different languages, people that uh, had different skin tones and different backgrounds and different nationalities and different cultures, different economic standpoints. I mean, there were Pharisees that got saved. There were probably tax collectors that got saved. There were probably prostitutes that got saved. By the way, probably more of those than there was Pharisees, Miss Lois. Uh, there were lots of different folks that got saved that day. And yet, the Bible tells us that group of people that were varied, that were diverse, and Christian, I believe this is the pattern for local church. The Bible says they were together. Can I, can I, I want to, I'm going to come way over here. <laughs> I, I, this is not part of the Bible study, but I want to give you something. This, this is not scripture. I'm going to tell you right now, this is riceology, so bear with me. But I believe this. I believe we do a disservice. I believe we do a disservice to a community and to a culture. When you have a church and you call that church, uh, whatever you want to call it, church. For instance, if there's an area uh, in some country where there's people that speak uh, whatever language, we'll say uh, in the southern U.S. there's some uh, groups of a lot of Hispanic-speaking people. And if you go to an area and you start, this is the Mexican church, an area where there's people from all over the world, I think we do a disservice to a local church by saying, oh, this is the Mexican church. Or this is the Filipino church. Or this is the whatever you want to fill in the blank. This is the Chinese church. No, I believe a church is a local church. A church is to be made up from whoever's in the area. And we see here that this church was made up of all those unique people. And yet they were together. God had me for many years in Chicago ministering in an area called the Albany Park District of Chicago. That area in the Guinness Book of World Records for many years, and maybe still today, had more nationalities in one spot than anywhere in the entire world. World, not, not, not anywhere in Chicago or in the world. One Sunday, I remember Resurrection Sunday, and I remember my mom and dad came up to visit me. I, was, uh, I wasn't married yet. I was a single uh, college student. I was, I was going to propose to my wife uh, that Christmas, but they came up that weekend, and my wife and I had my girlfriend at the time. We had just started dating a few months before, and my parents were there, and they spent the weekend with me, and they rode my bus, and I remember that weekend well because of a couple things. One, because our bus broke down on the side of the highway, but on the way to church that Sunday morning, I remember getting up to preach on the bus and looking back on the bus, and my parents were there. And I looked back on the bus, and I had a family from Jerusalem. And directly across the aisle from the family in, from Jerusalem was a family from Baghdad. Now, you have to understand, this was 1994 or 95. It was 95. You understand the culture of what all went on in Baghdad uh, just a few years previous. You understand how unusual that was to have a family from Jerusalem and a family from Baghdad sitting side by side and fellowshipping sweet fellowship. We had people, from, I think, from 20 different countries on that bus that day. 
But you know what united them? It wasn't culture. It wasn't where they were from. It wasn't what they believed about the world. It wasn't the place they called home. What united them was Jesus Christ. So I led both those families to Christ. Both of those families were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were together. Why? Because they believed Christ. I love the fact we have the picture of the church in Jerusalem. After all of these different people got saved, they gathered together and they were together. They were united. I believe biblically, principally, that's what a local church ought to be. They were together. They were different in age. They were different in background. They were different in temperament. But having trusted Christ, they had come together. They were not only together in the sense that they were in each other's presence, but they were all one in Christ. Look in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. That's togetherness. That's the picture here. God says in Christ, we're all the same. We're all the same. That togetherness. Now, I want you to turn back to our text. I want to talk to you about what that togetherness means. What it is. Number one, they grew together. They grew together. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They were babies in God's family. They were brand new babes in Christ and they grew up together in Christ. They, they devoted themselves. They continued steadfastly. We have a picture of growing in grace. Growing in grace. We're not going to turn there for sake of time tonight, but 2 Peter 3.18, if you want to write it down. Number one, they grew together. Number two, they fed on the word of God together. They fed on the word of God together. The Bible says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and breaking of bread and prayers. They, they devoted themselves to that teaching to the Word of God. The greatest need for us as God's children, as little babes in Christ, is to get the truth of the Word to grow. They fed on the Word together. Uh, number three, they spent much time together. Uh, they, they didn't just say, oh yeah, yeah we're, we're Christians now. Uh, you know, we'll see each other. You know, once a year we'll say, hey, let's have a reunion and come together. And oh, yeah, I remember, remember last year they got preached and you, know, you got baptized. And you know, I believe that I got baptized. No, they gathered every Lord's Day, they didn't forsake the assembly of themselves together, they, they spent much time together. That's how they, you know, the folks you see once a year. You may love them, you may care for them, and I know there are many folks you'd like to see more often, but there are folks you don't get to see often, but you are much closer to those that you spend time with. That togetherness came from that time spent together. I want to turn back to the Old Testament just for one second and read just a, just a verse for you. At the very end of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 In verse 16, it says, And they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. They spake often one to another. That's what it ought to be. That's the picture of the local church. They spent much time together. Not only that, they, number four, they remembered the Lord's death together. How did they do that through the Lord's Supper? The Bible speaks that breaking of bread, there's two connotations there. 
not only did they share meals together, I believe they did that, but also they broke bread as they remembered the Lord's death, as they were commanded by the Lord in that upper room. As they remembered that picture of Christ coming. At that table, the Lord's table, we look back to Calvary and up to the throne and look for his coming. Verse 42 as well, we see a picture and in prayers. They prayed together. They spent time together. They remembered the Lord's death together. They prayed together. Verse 44, and all that believed were together, there's the word again, and had all things common. We see the grace of generosity here that existed here in this early church. They shared. We see the pattern of, of meeting the needs of others. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 says, And I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. They shared. And lastly, as we think about the church being gloriously united in Christ, number seven, they rejoiced together. They rejoiced together. In verse 46, it says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house that eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. In verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people. They rejoiced together. They, they thrilled together. They joyed again and again together over what God had done. That's God's pattern for being united. That's how God could take a group of folks that spoke different languages and came from different backgrounds and bring them together and they could be united. They could be together. They could all be together. Because they followed the pattern of God. Number four. Number four and finally tonight. This local church was dynamically empowered through Christ. Dynamically empowered through Christ. I want you to hold your place here in the book of Acts. And would you turn to Philippians chapter four with me. A verse is probably familiar to many of you, most of you even. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. A verse we looked at just a couple of weeks ago, but I believe very important for our study as we close this thought tonight. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In Acts chapter 2, in our text, we have a picture of the church through Christ. It was the power of Christ. We have the record of the empowering which, which took place on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 4, over just a page there from your text, in verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. We'll read of that repetition again, the filling here in this passage. We've seen this church as a manifestation, the, this early church in Jerusalem, of the Spirit of God, the Spirit's work. By the Holy Spirit, Christ himself made this church what it was. It was his power, not our power. His power. Brother Darren has a kayak. Well, the kayak he has, if he wanted to, he could put a motor in it, I think. But he doesn't have a motor. He has a one horsepower. I mean, I'm sorry, a one <laughs> Darren power motor. And so when he gets in there, he's got pedals he puts his feet in, and that 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 kayak goes on. Uh, one Darren po horsepower. Uh, as he pedals, it's his power that moves the kayak. Now, if he took that and put a motor in it, 
it wouldn't be his power, it would be the motor's power. I read a magazine, a car magazine years ago, and it was an awesome, an awesome thing that someone did. At least I thought it was awesome. Some of you will think it's stupid, but as a hillbilly redneck, I thought it was awesome. Somebody took in this magazine I read, they, took a sh they went to a junkyard. The, the goal was to build a junkyard car. And they went and they bought a, at the junkyard, got a Chevette. How many of you remember the Chevrolet Chevettes? Uh, you know, I heard a, a story recently about a guy who started dating this girl and they got together and she got mad at him. And she said, I thought you said you drove a vet. He said, I drove, do drive a vet, a Chevette. Uh, it's different than a Corvette. But they took a Chevette. And if I remember right, they found an old uh, big block 502 cubic inch GM 502 cubic inch big block engine. And Brother Jim, they put a 502 dinosaur inside a Chevette. And man, sign me up. I want to drive it. Uh, I, 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 I read that article and I went, oh man. I need to go to the junkyard. I need to find me a little rear-wheel drive car. I need to find me a monster engine. I need to marry them together and see what it's like to have a 502 dinosaur inside of a Chevette. But on the opposite of that equation, imagine if you took the Chevette's engine and you put that in the big Cadillac, I think, that they took that 502 out of. And you tried to power that big land shark of a Cadillac with that tiny little Chevette engine. You press the gas. Finally, the wheels would start to move. Can I tell you, if we power the local church in our power, we go nowhere. This church was dynamically powered by Christ. It was his power. Two unique ways in which the empowering of the local church in Jerusalem, in which the empowered local church today, affected the members of that local church there, and I believe will affect us today. And not only the members of the local church of Jerusalem, not only us today, but those inside the reach and the scope and the umbrella of the local church, number one, the church members were characterized by holiness. How is that possible with the power of God? They were characterized by holiness, which made an impression on everyone. In verse 43, I want you to notice the words. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. These, in the early church, as we see in verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, they were having favor with all the people. They made an impact in their world. The power of God upon them that changed them impacted everything. It changed everything. I get a kick out of those who deny Jesus Christ lived. I talked to a guy about a year and a half ago. And so I tried to share the gospel. It's always, and nobody named Jesus ever lived. And I said, sir, I said, so you just totally reject every historical account of every historian uh, who believes Christ was the the, uh, the Messiah, as well as those who believe Christ was a devil. You, you just discredit all. No, no, he never lived. I love folks like that who every, every time they write a check and have to write the year down, although they don't even realize it. <laughs> the very year they're writing down is a result of in the year of our Lord, the fact that Christ came. Christ had an impact on these folks, changed their lives. And can I tell you, a changed life has an impact on those around it. These people's lives changed by the power of God. Man, it had an impact. Remember the demoniac of Gadara? 
he, he would cut himself. He lived in the tombs. They'd bind him with chains, and he'd break the chains. And he'd wail and gnash his teeth, and people were afraid of him, and they were scared of him. He was running around naked, a wild man in the tombs. And he met Jesus. And when the people came, they found him sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and the people were scared to death. Now, hold on a minute. If I've got a man sitting down, clothes on, and his right mind over there, and I got a crazy man naked, cutting himself, yelling, screaming, breaking chains right here, which one are you afraid of? I'm afraid of that guy. Can I tell you why they were afraid of that guy? Because they knew there was somebody there more powerful than the crazy man. It was not the wild man they were afraid of. They were afraid of Jesus Christ. They were fearful because they knew there was a power that had transformed this man that was more powerful than him. And can I tell you, a power more powerful than me, more powerful than you, has transformed me and has transformed you as a believer and transformed the early church, and they had a great impact an impression on everyone around them. And number two, we'll close with this thought tonight. Verse 43, the members of this church in Jerusalem were characterized by power. Verse 43, it says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. I want to ask you a question tonight. Are we powerful or are we pitifully weak? And that's a double-edged question. Because we are fleshly weak. But we have all power. We have all power. We have the power of God. The power to use us. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I want you to turn there as we close. The central theme, not the center verse, but the central theme of the whole book of Acts. Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. By the way, we've gotten to the Jerusalem part so far in the book of Acts. That's where we see the witnessing happening. But that power was to take it from Jerusalem and into Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. That's a power. A power of God, not the power of men. A power of God, not the power of Peter. A power of God, not the power of Paul. As we think about the local church, you're dynamically empowered through Christ. Christian, can I tell you that he's still the one that empowers us? He's still the one that empowers us. He's still the one. Still the one that has the power to give you to share Christ boldly. To live for him boldly. To have an impact on your family. On your culture. Susanna Wesley. Not a preacher. Just a godly mother, a godly mother that knew that the hand that rocked the cradle shapes the world. Susanna Wesley, just a Christian mom, just a Christian housewife and mother, every day spent time with one of her children, taught them, trained them, loved them, and she had a lot of kids. Susanna had a couple of boys who would go on to preach boldly Christ in amazing ways. It was the power of God through Susanna Wesley that she, God used to reach her boys. She never preached a message, but her boys did. I think of Dr. Lee Robertson. He's been in heaven a long time. 
Dr. Robertson, who was the pastor of the Great Highland Park Baptist Church in Tennessee Temple University for many years. Dr. Robertson, I heard him tell his testimony many times. I can still remember the name of the lady that won the Christ. Told the story about going to a Sunday school in a Baptist church. And a lady named Daisy Halls shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a young boy, Dr. Robertson was saved. I know the name Daisy Halls only because he repeated that name over and over again as he would share his testimony. But in her life, very few people knew Mrs. Halls. Just a country lady, a simple country lady that taught a simple children's Sunday school class in a very small rural country church at the turn of the century. But because of the power of the Holy Spirit empowered Mrs. Hawes to love the children in her Sunday school class, a Dr. Lee Robertson would impact the world. Christian, the members of this local church were characterized by the power of God and God's power being used through them to reach others who reached others who reached others who reached others for the gospel as we have the pattern of the local church. Let's pray together. Lord, help us, Lord, to see, Lord, that you're the one that establishes the pattern for the local church. Lord, it's not up, up to us to tailor the church for our culture or our time period or our place, our country or our preference. But God, may we follow your plan. Lord, may we be reminded that you're the one that gives life to the church. Lord, may we be openly committed to you. Lord, I pray and I thank you for the unity that we enjoy here. Lord, how wonderful that is. Lord, may be unique in, in our world today, but not unique in your plan. Lord, I thank you for the unity we can have of being together. Lord, I thank you that we, just like the church in Jerusalem, are empowered and to be empowered dynamically through you. Lord, you want to use us to affect our world, our culture. You want to use us and empower us to reach somebody who can reach somebody who can reach somebody with the gospel that all the world may know. God, help us to follow your pattern. Bless us now, Lord. May you be glorified tonight. Be with us this week as we endeavor to show forth Christ. And Lord, may your will be done in our lives and our heart. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. You can be dismissed.